Hey guys, what's up? We're about to go around the farm for a lovely evening stroll. I've got my cup of tea ready and I'm very excited to share this with you guys. But first I wanted to remind you that right now our merch pre-order is open. We do all of our merch through pre-orders. We work with a company out of Arkansas used to be a local business, less local now, but still a small business called Be Unlimited. And they print all of our shirts for us. Uh, we pick materials that are more ethically sourced. And through working with this company, we've been able to provide a much higher quality product. So today I'm wearing one of our new colors of our uh, Real Food Come Sturdy design. This is the 100% cotton. Um, when you go on there, there's CC, like if you look at the listings and each listing, if you don't want to click on each one to find out what the material blend is, there's CC, which is Comfort Colors. That's 100% cotton. And then there's also B and C, Bella and Canvas, which is the sustainably sourced blend. Um, so this is the 100% cotton comfort colors, this lovely burnt orange. I think this may be my new favorite Real Food Comes Dirty t-shirt. You're probably going to be seeing it a lot, but um, we have some new designs as well as the old faithfuls like this one in Store Bought Tomatoes Taste Like Disappointment. We have a brand new shirt that says Eat Real Food as well as a pocket tee with a sunflower. I'm super excited about all of them. It's only going to be open for a couple of weeks if you want to hop in on this and get in on this pre-order make sure you click the link below hmm, I got some excited boys what's up dudes hey. all right guys let's go for a walk Hi. well you were sweaty no, you playing the you ran to the pond all the way there and back wow Ben's buddy is over it's spring break and they're enjoying some country boy time they're begging me to let them swim in the pond but I'm doing other things. I don't let them swim in the pond unless I'm outside uh, with them. Of course, now they're going in to eat dinner. I just got done cooking. All right, so I actually brought my side-by-side -side up here because I wanted to collect the eggs and then stick them in the side-by-side -side and then go for my walk. It's the time of year where I really need to start collecting eggs twice a day. So something awful happened today. In the last vlog, I picked up a goose egg. I gave it to Will. He took it home. It was sitting out in the middle of the field. I thought away from the geese that were sitting on the eggs. Apparently it was a reject that they had banished out of the nest and away. And Will and Taylor cracked the egg. And I'm sure it was extremely devastating because it was beginning to develop. And it just made me realize like it's time to start collecting the eggs twice a day. Now it's not 90 degrees, 32 Celsius every day yet, but that's all it takes for eggs to start developing. And so for me, the way that I have over the course of nearly 10 years of keeping chickens, largely avoided ever cracking into any eggs that were developing, I say largely, not entirely, is collecting them twice a day. And we're there. We have, we have started the twice a day egg collection and I didn't want to carry around my egg collection with my mug and camera so i brought the side by side up here i'll get the eggs ditch them and then we're going for a walk hey pretty birds hello so we get the eggs every morning when we feed the birds and when it's warm outside we get the eggs in the evening also and by doing so, we guarantee that no eggs ever sit out in the coop for more than 12 hours. Now, the thing is, is that when eggs first start developing, you can still eat them. Um, they're gonna have like just a very, very tiny bit of membrane with like veins in it. But I don't wanna do that. I just don't want to. I just don't want to. <laughs> now, I could just not keep a rooster and our eggs wouldn't be fertilized and it would never even be an issue. But gosh, isn't he pretty? People actually ask me that a lot. Like, do you have to have a rooster in order to get eggs? And absolutely not. So hens lay eggs kind of like women have their menstrual cycles. I know it's kind of gross because you probably like eating eggs. And so that analogy just doesn't usually settle well, but it is actually the most effective analogy. Um, hens are gonna lay their eggs every single day or you know, five times a week, however frequently they do, whether there's a rooster not around to fertilize the eggs or not. That's why a lot of people who don't eat meat because they don't want to end a life to eat something will still eat eggs. It's called being an ovo-vegetarian because technically it's not a life because it's not fertilized. Ooh, look at that one. That one is nice. Little Easter egg going on out here. There actually are very few eggs out here because probably most of these girls lay early in the morning and those are the ones that were already collected today. 
The other reason why I go ahead and collect extra when it's warmer is that in the spring and summer is whenever chickens are more likely to go broody. And if you have a hen sitting on the eggs, obviously they're being kept to the correct temperature to develop. So if you have a broody hen, uh, you wanna collect your eggs twice a day just to make sure that you don't get any surprises when you crack them. Oh, Taylor and Will, I'm so sorry about the goose egg. I literally cried. <laughs> I actually cried when he texted me. <laughs> Don't feel bad for texting me, but I actually cried. <laughs> I felt so bad. God, I would be scarred. I have been scarred. It's happened to me before, but it was my own fault. It wasn't somebody else giving it to me and me trusting them. <laughs> you are the prettiest birds in the whole wide world. <laughs> all the horses are just running full bore across the pasture and they have been for like five minutes and I don't know why <laughs> you want to know my favorite thing about farm life it's getting to see horses horse and chickens chicken it's getting to see cows cow like when I'm out here in the evening or whenever and the horses are just running full on. I mean, it's their gallop, it like reverberates through the ground and they've got this, what, 13 acre pasture or something like that, that they are just hauling butt through and they're just going in circles all the way around and I'm getting to see my horses be horses. And uh, like here with the chickens. We move them to new grass regularly and I'm watching them scratch around and eat bugs and they're doing what they're designed to do. When I go out there and I see my pigs wallowing, my cows just grazing, resting in the, sh the shade. It's amazing. I love being on a farm and watching like creation be what it's meant to be. It, it's amazing. And that's not even counting the undomesticated stuff. Like, you hear all those frogs on the pond? I go on these walks in the evening along the side of the pond, all the big bullfrogs jump off into the water, and I watch the blue heron come. He's been here this whole time, and uh, he fishes, and we have bald eagles that come and fish our pond, and I'm just enamored by, like, just being a part of something that works, and that's beautiful and lovely. I just, those horses galloping just got me in my feels. All right, tea, eggs, and I turn the fence back on so we don't wake up to raccoons having raccooned. So this flock is significantly younger than the other flock, and we've been having way more broody hens in this flock. Exhibit A. I know, I'm sorry. Look at that lovely little clutch of eggs. Hey there, handsome. So why have a rooster? If you don't need him to get eggs, what's the point? Well, I am particularly fond of roosters. I think that they're beautiful. The ambiance of a rooster's crow is so quintessentially farm-like. Um, I love the sound of a rooster, but I think they make the ladies happy. They do help in some regard protect them. Now, are they gonna protect them from like a pack of coyotes or a, really any predator while they're all sleeping? No, but when hawks fly over the rooster crows, all the girls go underneath the coop. I do think that it's good. And it does bring a level of sustainability to chicken keeping that otherwise you just wouldn't have. While we are taking the risk that we could end up with accidentally cracking open an egg that is fertilizing, um, if we so wanted, this basket of eggs could become another flock of laying hens. Well, half of them would be male, so um, it would be a relatively small flock. But I mean, honestly, in this basket of eggs, you could have a whole flock of laying hens. And this is just this afternoon's collection. So it does bring a level of sustainability to keeping chickens. I do have a broody hen out there. Right now, we are not letting those broody hens um, hatch anything. 
The reason being we don't really have a way to protect them. These coops that have the little ramps that get into them are not really the best for baby chicks. However, Maya and I were talking about potentially building like a broody apartment, um, which would be just like a little coop that's on the ground that's in a separate netting. We would probably use the shocker knot netting that helps to keep in baby chicks and maybe just letting broody mamas go and raise up a small clutch. Because I actually really love broodiness in birds. Again, it adds sustainability. We we kind of approach our homestead with, I don't really think it's a unique approach. I'm sure there are other people doing this. But like right now, we can order grain just fine. We can order chicks just fine. Like for us, it's like, sure, let's order Cornish crosses to raise for meat. Let's keep Jersey cows that live on grain uh, to get lots and lots of milk. Because right now we have access to that. But for me, I always have like a plan B in the back of my mind that if I needed to truly go fully sustainable I could that's why I like keeping birds that go broody because if need be you would want roosters and broody hens to keep the generations of your flocks going so you always had fresh hens laying do I feel like that's fully necessary right now like obviously not I still order chicks and I still buy grain um, but it gives me a level of, of feeling secure that I have those things. But I'm very aware that that broody hen is there and that's why I get the eggs. So um, here's my collection for the evening. Another big benefit for me if, is that it's supposed to start raining in a couple of hours and rain equals muddy feet, muddy feet equals dirty eggs. Well, look how beautiful and clean these are. I don't even have to wash these. They are perfect. And I prefer that to eggs covered in mud and poop. All right, let's go for a walk. The horses are still making laps. I wonder if it's they feel that storm coming. Also, Bosco was a barrel horse before he came to us. Like, he won lots of awards and stuff. And sometimes he cuts the cows for fun. Like, he just goes out there and cuts the cows on his own. And the cows don't really seem that terribly bothered by it, so we haven't really intervened with that at all. And that might be what's happening. I don't know. I'll keep an eye on it. How beautiful is this? It's just so peaceful. I wish you guys could feel it. Oh, there's something down here I really want to show y'all. Look at this. Lovely. So these are actually the tea posts for the trellises in the garden. So when we got this property, it had a lot of really old fencing on it and we pulled everything up and most of the actual fencing material was not salvageable. It wasn't gonna be good for anything, but we kept all the old tea posts because I knew that I was going to be doing lots of trellising in my garden and I like using cattle panels. And that was a resource that just came with our farm. They're pretty beat up looking. So we decided to just paint them a few different colors. We used Rust-Oleum spray paint, just something we got at the local Ace hardware store. Oh, hi, zucchini girl. Hey, Zuzu, you wanna go to the garden? <laughs> Zuzu is my new garden kitty. I guess that's what we get for naming her, zucchini. Will went to the store the other day and he told me that cattle panels were like 40 or $45, which when I first made my arch trellis video, several of you commented from specifically Canada. You told me in Canada there were like $100 a piece, but in very like urban areas, you told me they were very expensive. When I first started with gardening, cattle panels were 20 bucks and you could get them marked down if they were like scratch and dent for like $5. So. 45 bucks each. We bought several of them and we moved some of them here. So I think I have enough this year to set my garden up that I don't have to go buy them at $45 each, but ugh, that was supposed to be the cheap way <laughs> to trellis your garden. I guess if cattle panels are $45, there's no telling how much the expensive stuff costs. Either way, I was really glad to be able to salvage. I think we've pulled 50 T posts out and there are more back there. Those are just the less beat up ones. So the big task I have to come up with is where I'm going to put these trellises. And I've got to decide by like tomorrow. And I keep coming down here because the way that I decide these things is I sit and I imagine them. Oh, look at this. Look 
at the beauty of it. All right, I know we, I said we were gonna walk, but if a walk leads to a good sit and chat, I mean, that's a success, right? So this pavilion patio is such a dream. I told you guys in the last vlog that we went down to Charleston this week. We took our kids down on a little bit of a history tour for spring break. Uh, Jeremiah and I decided that on spring break from now on, we're gonna take like educational trips. We're gonna take trips to places where there's history to be discovered. Because our kids are actually really interested in that. We wanna feed that. Uh, but we went down to Charleston. It was close to home and that's really what we had in our um, budget and in our time availability to be able to provide. It was a great trip. While we were there, my friend Michael, who has been working on this pavilion patio with Jim, his friend that he works with, uh, came in and sealed it. So he posted a video of this process. I'll put a link to it down below if you want to see it. Um, he videoed the process and put it on his channel, which is called My Happy Progress. Uh, but yeah, I came home. We got home last night. It was like almost sunset. It was very dusky. I was dark within like 15 minutes. I had Jeremiah drop me off in the driveway so I could check on my plants. And I just came out here and sat. And this is so beautiful that I, I genuinely like teared up. And I just come on it and I have to be barefoot. <laughs> it's, so, it's so nice. A lot of people had asked me if I was concerned about this being a slip hazard if we sealed it. And it's, it's not slick. It looks kind of slick, but it's actually still got a lot of texture to it. So I'm not worried about it being a slip hazard at all. But it sure does look shiny, doesn't it? So I've been sitting in this space and imagining what it's going to be like. <laughs> By imagining what it's going to be like, I'm figuring out where I want to put my trellises. So I want to share something with you that is not a tutorial. This is not a how-to. I cannot give you the advice that I am about to kind of give you. I'm a very visual person. I think in pictures. Dr. Temple Grandin wrote a book called Visual Thinkers. The first time I ever heard her speak was truly like a light bulb coming on in my mind. She talked about a certain type of people that are largely not accommodated in today's school system. And I'm very thankful that I was like in the tail end of people like me being accommodated. I see the world in pictures. I remember the world in pictures. I describe things based on how they feel to me. And the way she explained this truly has changed my life. If you've never listened to Doc Dr. Temple Grandin's work, I would highly encourage you to do that. She was at the Homesteading Festival at Rory Feeks last year. It's the first time I ever really heard her speak. And I seriously just sat in the crowd with like tears running down my face because it was like giving me language to understand myself. But she wrote a book, it's called Visual Thinkers. I'll put a link down below to it as well. Anyway, I digress. When I imagine spaces, um, when I imagine garden spaces, when I imagine projects, I am a very artistic person, but the way that those things come to life for me is that I sit there and I just think about them until I can see them. And I don't know if that works for everybody. There's a very good chance that it doesn't, and that's completely okay. We are all wired differently. We are diverse and wonderful, and that diversity is beautiful. We shouldn't all be the same. But I want to encourage you to try. And if it doesn't work for you to sit and imagine a space, um, then that's okay. But you've got another way for that to come to you. You are creative and beautiful and wonderful and your mind is capable of so much. And if it's different than mine, that's completely okay. But I think there are probably a lot of people out there that probably are visual thinkers and visual learners that probably can sit down and imagine a space, but have just never been instructed to do so. And for me, I sit in this space and I think, what do I want it to feel like? What do I want this to feel like? I have sat in this chair right here trying to figure out where my trellis placement is going to go. And I've imagined, what do I want it to feel like? And what I've decided is that I definitely want to feel hemmed in. So I'm thinking some wall trellises on these long beds right here. I'm also thinking that on this bed, as well as that one, I need to plant something tall because I definitely want this space to feel somewhat private, somewhat hemmed in. And whenever we're planning a garden, it's not always just what's going to be the most effective to make this garden grow. Obviously you have to consider that stuff. But 
also considering how is this going to make the garden feel? How are the growing habits of these plants going to ultimately add to the structure of this garden? Like okra in these raised beds is going to get 10 feet tall. It's going to be big and bushy and filled out. So that would be a really great plant for me to put right here if I'm wanting to create a hemmed in space. A trellis wall, kind of like this right here. This is what I'm calling a trellis wall. This is just a piece, but sometimes I'll put long cattle panel trellises with T-posts all the way down a bed. And when that's planted with like pole beans that are going to grow all the way up and cover it, it's going to be a wall. It's going to create a very enclosed space. So I wouldn't necessarily want to put that right here on the interior of my garden because then that would block my view from part of the garden. But it would be a really great thing to put right here when it's blocking like the view of Jeremiah's tool trailer in our house. See what I'm saying? This is why I think it's so important that we consider the whimsy and we consider how things make us feel. I love to tell you guys <laughs> to name your garden and hang the wind chimes and buy the little gnome in pajamas if that's what woos your heart, whatever it is. Um, if it's a frog statue that's playing a banjo or if it's big metal flowers or if it's garden flags, whatever it is to make your space feel right to you. I know that doesn't necessarily feel important. I know that from a very practical standpoint, somebody could say, Come on, tell me how to grow a garden effectively. Tell me how to feed my family effectively. But if your heart is in your garden, it won't die. If your heart is in your garden, it won't go to weeds. If you love to be in your garden, it's going to produce something. And if you love to be in your garden so much, that you'll be in it again next year and the year after that and the year after that, then you have effectively become a gardener versus what a lot of people try to do, which is I'm going to try to grow some food this year. So they, they do a little garden thinking I'm going to grow some food and then they don't get a big harvest and they're like, oh, that didn't work out for me. Gardening wasn't for me. It's easier to buy it from the store. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to create a garden that you, are, you love. And what that may be is sitting down and just letting your imagination wander over that place until literally the feeling of it just captivates your heart. It's not silly. That is not a silly thing. <laughs> I know when a person comes to me, when I go to these conferences and these meetups and stuff, and a person comes to me and they pull out their phone, I want you to know I love it when you show me pictures of your garden. When you are so proud of that thing that you've been taking photos of it and you just want to share it with somebody, I recognize love when I see it. I recognize infatuation and affection when I see it. And when I see that in people, I know that I have been able to inspire a person not just to grow a garden, but to become a gardener. And a gardener will always create gardens. And gardens, ultimately, under the hands of a gardener that cares, will produce food. The goal, yes, we want to produce food, but it is ultimately not the main goal. The goal is to create a space that woos your heart. Because that will, that will produce so much more in the long run. Oh, can you all tell that I'm just jazzed because it's warm outside? <laughs> have my garden back. Can you tell? Uh, I'm having tea in my garden with you and it is very good. Thank you for hanging out with me today and all the days that you do. I bless you. Until next time.